There is only one almighty God. And that is an amazing thought to really stop and think about the vastness of all that we see and all that we are, all that has ever been and all that ever will be. And you trace the origin of that back to one single almighty being. And that is a staggering thought. It's a staggering thought. Songs, words, simply cannot truly capture and truly do justice to the magnificence and the awesomeness, all these things we've sung about and said, all of these things we've poetically said, all of the scriptures that we have, the Psalms, all of the, all of the prophecies, all of the uh, praises, all of the things that we have, words simply in our language or in any other, they simply do not fully capture the magnificence of this one who is God. And yet he has called us. And indeed, as the psalmist said, and then later gets uh, uh, requoted in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, what is man that you, speaking about that one being, that you are mindful of him? It's an amazing thing that God is mindful of us. But the purpose of us is to be mindful of Him. I looked at the world population clock this morning. And boy, that little sucker's amazing. It just sits there and tick, 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 tick. Over 7 billion as of this morning is what's estimated... Seven billion human beings on the face of this planet. But less than half, perhaps, or right at half of that number of people on the face of the earth today all claim faith in a monotheistic, everybody say monotheistic. monotheistic. That's your fancy triple word score scrabble for the day. Word. Monotheistic, which means monotheistic, one God type of faith. A faith in one being who is God. Now, there's a lot to say about the definition of monotheism as people apply it. That in and of itself is also not our focus for today. Our focus for today is this. Of these people on the planet, these billions, it is these, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jewish people, who all claim a faith in one who is God. One who is God. That God is one being. And specifically, it's interesting that all three of these, these major world religions, Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam, all three of these major world religions, they all claim faith in the God of someone, the God of Abraham. They all claim roots back to this one Abraham. Ani el Shaddai. Or, depending on the syntax in which it's used, el Shaddai Ani is the Hebrew phrase that speaks to God Almighty alone. God Almighty alone. 
The ani there is the alone or I. It's used to show forth emphasis. When you see, when we see in the Hebrew Old Testament this uh, phraseology, ani el shaddai, it is God Almighty alone, alone I, God Almighty, as if, he, if he's speaking it. If it's in reference to him, it's still emphatic. It's God Almighty alone. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am God Almighty. El Shaddai, Ani. I am God Almighty. One being. I, God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. This is a relationship. By this point, this is Genesis 17. God's already spoken to Abram. I've called you, God is saying to Abram. I've called you and I want you to walk with me. It's a very personal one-to-one -one relationship is what I want us to focus on. This all starts, what we experience and know today, the great world religions all start, they have in their origin all the way back. All three of these great religions, they have all of, their, all of their way back. They all claim historicity links to this. This relationship between Abram, one man, and one God. I am God Almighty. El Shaddai. There's no comparison to this one. Someone, when we use the term almighty, we are technically doing something, whether we realize it or not. When we designate one as almighty, that's to the exclusion of everybody else. It means you put one at the top, at the pinnacle, at the peak. There is only one that can be described as almighty. Certainly in the sense in which he is almighty. Ani, alone. I, God almighty. I alone. He speaks to Abraham and he says, walk with me. And that thus begins a journey of incredible import. With incredible ramifications. I want you to understand this morning that you're sitting here this morning in part because of just this simple relationship, this simple opportunity that God Almighty gave to Abraham. Part of the reason that you're in this room is because God said to one man, one God said to one man, walk with me. All of us, well, did the Apostle Paul call Abraham the father of the faithful. Because it all stems back to this moment. Walk with me. And Abraham did. In Genesis 35th chapter, God is speaking to Abraham's grandson and God said to him your name is Jacob you shall no longer be called Jacob it's funny isn't it God really had a problem with this family and their naming I say had a problem he didn't have a problem but he, 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 he really he really uh, uh, liked uh, giving them new names Abraham gets to be Abraham because of God. Sarah, the mother, right? She gets to be named Sarah because of God too. Little 
tweaks of their names. But here you get to the grandson, here you get to Jacob, and his name is really going to get changed. His name is going to get changed from Jacob to Israel. That's an amazing thing. Your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him. Somebody came and gave him a new name. Somebody came and spoke to him. Somebody came and interceded in his life. Who was it in Jacob's mind? That's what I'm wanting us to focus on here. Who was it in Jacob's mind that did this? Who is it that Jacob is experiencing? Who is it that Jacob is not hearing about but really experiencing in his own life? Who is it? Who is it? Ani El Shaddai. I alone, me, I, God Almighty. So now, the one who had called his grandfather, he had interaction with his father Isaac as well, of course, but the one who called his grandfather and blessed him all the days of his life, now this same one. By the way, is it a different one, do you think? that's speaking to Jacob? Is it a different one? Or is it the same one that spoke to his father Abraham? Clearly. We don't have to worry about that. But I'm saying, I'm saying for, for interest of keeping our focus, it's the same one who called the one man Abraham, the same one is now speaking to Abraham's grandson Jacob and saying, you're no longer going to be called Jacob. Now I'm going to call you Israel. Why is it that the children of Israel are called the children of Israel and not the children of Jacob? They could be called the children of Jacob, but why were they so often from the rest of this point forward in your Bible, why do you see this term, the children of Israel, the children of Israel? Who called the children of Israel out of Egypt? Why is it that the children of Israel are the one? Why is that? Because God, Ani El Shaddai, spoke to Jacob and said, Your name's not long, no longer Jacob. Now your name is Israel. So now all the descendants of the people that came after are called children of Israel. How come? Because Ani El Shaddai said, You are. You have a new name. God Almighty, God alone. Certainly by the time you get to Moses' day, when Moses will be the one who will lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, when you get to Moses in Exodus, the third chapter, and we do get to the burning bush, Brother Kirk, <laughs> The burning bush and the voice says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Put your shoes from off your feet. This is holy ground and so on and so on. But in verse 6, he said, I am also the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Who is it in Moses' mind that he has had a conversation with? Who is it that he has uh, heard the voice of? Is it somebody different than the one who said to Abraham, come and follow me? Is it somebody different than the one who said to Jacob, Ani El Shaddai, I am God. Almighty, I alone. Is it somebody different? And you're, uh, you're saying, why are you asking me that? Of course, that's a silly question. I know it's a silly question, but the reason I'm asking it is to fix that thought in our mind. There is a continuity here that we can't overlook and we must not fail to appreciate. There is a continuity here in terms of who it is that 
the peoples from Abraham all the way forward are making covenant with. Everybody say covenant. covenant. What's covenant? Covenant is a agreement. It's a relationship. There are two great and mighty overriding covenants that we can think of right off. Two sections of the Bible are named for these covenants. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And in general terms, when we're speaking of those two, in general terms, when we refer to the Old Covenant, we're actually referring to a covenant, an agreement between God and the children of Israel mediated by Moses when God brought them out of captivity in the land of Egypt and brought them over into the promised land. That's generally referred to as the Old Covenant. But it's an agreement between God and man. And then there is the New Covenant. And when we speak of the New Covenant, we're referring to the agreement between God and humankind, God and mankind, of salvation and hope and kingdom life and eternal life and immortality and resurrection from the dead and so on. Redemption, salvation, all of these things which come through the agreement that is made between God and mankind mediated by Jesus Christ. But these are all in general terms, they are covenants which are in general terms nothing more complex than agreements between two parties. One being God and the rest being men, mankind, human beings. The Old Covenant, the children of Israel. The New Covenant, the disciples, the believers in Jesus Christ. So here we have it. Covenant. But these covenants are also in general terms can be made between God and individuals. It's a covenant, one way of looking at it. That's all I'm saying. One way of looking at it is God covenanted with Abraham, when he said to him, leave your home and your kindred and go to this land that I will show you and eventually I will give you. That sounds like an agreement. It's you do this and I will do this. Is that, is that true? Is that fair? God says, if you do this, then I will do this. Abraham, if you do this, I will give you this land. If you follow me, I will make your descendants as numerous as the sand of the, sand of the sea, the stars of the sky. I will do this if you will do this. Each side has a part in the agreement in the covenant. Is that true? But it is a one-to-one -one relationship here, particularly with Abraham, that's very amazing. Here's the party of the first part is Ani El Shaddai. The party of the second part, in terms of Abraham, is Abraham. The covenant between God and Abraham is Abraham. Wow. Was it somebody different in Moses' mind that he was covenanting with, agreeing with, when God appears to him in the burning bush and says, I'm going to use you to bring my people out of captivity here in, or there, he's in Midian I guess, but back in Egypt. Is Moses thinking that he's speaking to somebody different than the one to whom Abraham was speaking? The one to whom Jacob was speaking when he built the, built the altar and had his name changed, so on. No, because the one who is speaking to Moses is telling Moses, I am the God of your father, first of all, but Going even further back, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And who is that? He's God Almighty. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 3 and 4, of course, 
Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is such an important verse. It has, a, it has its own name taken from the Hebrew. It is sometimes known as the Shema Israel or for short, the Shema, which we've learned all this before. Pastor Dan's taught us, taught us this before. What does the word Shema mean? It's a Hebrew word, but what does the word Shema mean? Here, listen. listen. Listen up. Hear. Hear. So when it is spoken, and even today, among Jews and Christians who are aware, when it is spoken, it is spoken emphatically most of the time. Should be. Shema Israel. It's listen up, Israel. Now, when it says, when it's written in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the original fellow who was named Israel is long dead. So now we see that. That name has come to apply to all of the nation, all of the descendants, all of the people as a whole. And it's meant to be an exhortation to the people. It's meant to be an exhortation to those children of Abraham, those descendants of Isaac, those descendants of Jacob, those children of Israel. It's meant to be an exhortation to them and also to cause them to reset and refocus and recenter their attention on their God. And it defines who their God is. Oh Israel, you should listen. I wanted you to notice that the word Shema is actually in verse 3 as well. <laughs> you should Shema and be careful to do it, these things, these commandments and so on, that it may be well with you, but so on. And then in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, which is called the Shema Israel, we have this incredible Affirmation, declaration, meant to be remembered, meant to be known. All the way up into the New Testament, days in the New Testament, when Jesus lived in the flesh. We have people of Jewish faith, of monotheistic faith in the God who called Abraham, we have people who take this verse, Shema Israel, and they write it and roll it up and put it in a little box called a phylactery. And in fact, we know it today mostly in a negative context because the Lord Jesus uses it as part of, uses the term as part of a rebuke, actually of scribes and Pharisees that were being hypocritical in his day. You make broad your phylacteries. Now, how many of you knew what a phylactery was? <laughs> a phylactery was, it was a, it was a, it was a box or a little, like a, little, a leather uh, box, little thing that you would actually put on either your, your uh, hand, your arm, or sometimes even your forehead. Say, so, what? Yeah, yeah. And inside that, many times you would have a important scripture. And inside that many times, what would be put in there would be considered the granddaddy flagship scripture of all Jewish faith. And that was, guess what? This one, the Shema Israel. Because what was stressed from generation to generation to generation was <coughs> the God that we are serving. The God who spoke to Abraham. He is the 
supreme, almighty being in the universe. Now, before we just all shake our heads and say, oh, yeah, 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 we know that. I want you to understand something. For centuries, if you read your scriptures as we're doing today, they reaffirmed that thought over and over again. It didn't become tiresome to them, and it didn't become something that they, that they felt like you, know, you could ever just take for granted. For them, that was an essential that needed to be constantly reaffirmed. The One Almighty. That's who we serve. That's who we deal with. That's who we, if He gives us opportunity, we covenant with. Do we know, do we serve the God Abraham knew and served? That's the question. That's the question before us today. Not only do we know Him in terms of uh, uh, introductory knowledge, do we know Him experientially? Are His ways our ways? Are we walking as children of His and children of Abraham, regardless of our physical descendancy? Do we know Abraham's God. Ani El Shaddai. And we're going to end with one from the New Testament, and yet it also gives us a very forward looking view in terms of the worship and the appreciation of God. This one that called Abraham, the one that renamed Jacob, and so on, the one that uh, called Moses and used him to be a a uh, mediator and a redeemer and a lawgiver to the nation, the one who by Moses uh, told Israel to listen that God is one. It is the same God that is being worshipped and being extolled and envisioned here as seen by John in the book of the Revelation. We have another picture of that same one, that almighty God being worshipped. So notice this, and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Now notice, so the point of this is uh, seeing these overcoming redeem, uh, redeemed uh, believers. And he says, I saw them standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses. Everybody say the song of Moses. Well, now, what, is this, what does this mean, the song of Moses? And well, then he goes on to say, the servant of God, Moses, the servant of God, and he goes on to say, the song of the Lamb. Everybody say, the song of the Lamb. Amen. I think that what we can really uh, understand from this is something we could very over, over easily overlook. And that is this. The song that we're about to hear what the song is. We're about to hear what the worship is. We're about to hear what the glory is. But John, as it's being revealed to him, and as he's recording it, he records this as a, quote, song of Moses, a song of the Lamb. The Lamb, of course, being who? Jesus, right? I think what we can understand from this is there is a continuity in terms of this is a song, this is an uh, expression of praise and glory and honor that Moses would agree with. This, too, is an expression of praise and glory and honor that the Lord Jesus would agree with. So again, we're talking about this morning this consistency between the view of the fathers and all the way down to our Lord and our Master, Jesus Christ. What we're seeing here is we have a vision of worship of God, the song of Moses, we're about to hear what the song is, the song of the Lamb, we're about to hear what the song is, and notice what the song says. 
Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. I told you in Hebrew what that was, and we read that several times this morning. Ani El Shaddai. Ani El Shaddai. Lord God Almighty, meaning supreme. Nobody compares to Him and Ani alone. I alone. I alone. O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Nations, in this case, referring to not just nation states like lines on a map like we have, but nations in terms of what makes up a nation. People do. People do. So really what we're saying here is what's being extolled here by this choir, if you will, or, or this uh, worship troop <laughs> of those that have overcome uh, the beast, what we're, what we're seeing here is we're seeing them worship the great almighty God. Moses, who talked to him and called him from that burning bush? Who was it that separated him out and rose him uh, for great things? Why, the God of his father and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's who called him. So would Moses sing praise to this great almighty one? Sure he would. And most notedly... Would Jesus, the Lamb of God, join in praise to this great Almighty? Would He subscribe to that notion? That's what I'm saying. Yes, He would. He would. And we can. And should. Because notice this. He ends by saying, O King of the nations. Now it goes on to say, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify Your name? That's a rhetorical question. What they're saying is what? Everybody's going to fear. Everybody's going to glorify your name. And whose name are they going to glorify? Well, they're going to glorify the God of Moses. They're going to glorify the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to glorify this one who called that first one, if you will. It's a perspective, a way of looking at it. But one God calling one man Abraham sets all this into motion, including and up to you and I being gathered together in this room today. Events were set in motion by just that one really simple event. Powerful, mighty, but simple in terms of very uncomplicated. One incredible God. Not that he's not complicated, but... This is not all that complicated. One incredible God speaking, calling to one man. And one man saying, I will. Wow. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? The answer to that rhetorical question is nobody. Right now we have the choice, but eventually the glory of the Lord. The knowledge of the Lord in the sense of acknowledgement, really knowing who He is, is going to cover the earth as the waters of the sea. This choir is saying, you alone are holy. All nations, and again, not just talking about lines on a map here, but what are we really saying? What are they really saying when they're referring to all nations? They're saying everybody, all peoples, all peoples will come and worship you. All people will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. I hope we have a somewhat of a better uh, appreciation. We haven't talked about anything new today. I hope though that we've talked about things that stoke our, stoke us, our, our, our memories and our appreciation to understand the one, this one, alone, singular, almighty God who is responsible for everything that we are, everything that we shall be. It is He whom we are called to serve. It is He who alone is almighty. 
and worthy of that praise as Almighty God.